Good morning to all my friends and family and welcome to this episode of Jim's 5am Club. I welcome you to the first day of winter, the first of the month, first of June, um, and a, a cold, a cold windy day. We've had a uh, cold snap come up from the uh, south and it really is reminding us <laughs> it really is reminding us that uh, autumn is over and springtime and summer are distant memories. Anyway, I'm just down here below the Piermont Bridge, the famous Piermont Bridge, on this beautiful, crisp winter's morning. And as much as I don't like winter, there is a realisation that uh, we need to have the winters in our lives in order to enjoy and celebrate the summers, the springs and the other seasons. So it's all part of a spectrum. So we just need to learn how to make the most of what we've got. And I remember reading in a, uh, another book summary that I presented that there are some countries in the world that have words for days like today where you can walk into the into the teeth of a brisk cold breeze and they say that it's something which is therapeutic and good for your health so i guess the the, the point and the lesson is that we need to embrace all the seasons we need to embrace all the weather conditions and know that they are here to serve us and we can use them, we can leverage them and we can um, incorporate them into our lives in a productive and positive way. Anyway, what I'll do now is in the tradition of Jim's 5am club, I'll go through and do a book summary and the book summary today is a book which is entitled Time to Think by an author named Nancy Klein. Time to Think is a book which reminds us and encourages us and calls us to action to basically spend a little bit more time in our lives um, thinking and using the critical thinking skills that we have available to us and to know and the observation that the author makes at the beginning of her book summary and her book is to know that the mind that has the problem also holds the solution to the problem. I guess it's critical to understand that we humans are teleological in nature. And what teleological in nature means um, means that when posed with a problem, when we have an issue or a challenge, uh, what we do and what we love doing and what we're designed to do is to think about these things, to identify patterns and to come up with a solution. Just like in the days of old, you know, people wanted to dive deeply into the ocean and they came up with this diving suit and uh, you know you just look around the city at the construction at the building you see the ships the boats everywhere you look you see man's ingenuity his ability to take complex complicated abstract problems and find not only one but many different solutions one better than the other to all of these problems. I might go for a walk over here along the boardwalk and see where it leads us. But uh, the book by Nancy Klein um, basically goes through and peels and reveals some things about thinking that we all need to consider, at least in our lives. And she says here, that we all are invited to turn our environments 
and our social circles into thinking environments where we encourage and promote the art of thinking and our call to action according to this author is to leave where possible a thinking legacy nice words nice thoughts and as a parent and as a grandparent I guess what we all want is to make sure that the future generations are capable of uh, coming up with suitable productive solutions to all of their challenges and problems and to not surrender their ability to um, manage and traverse uh, the future into other people's hands but to feel confident and competent to be able to think clearly and think deeply about the problems they have at hand and to come up with options and multiple solutions to uh, help them and uh, the loved ones around them. The author goes on to say something which is quite profound and she says that uh, most people are profoundly unsettled when, um, when confronted with the question, what do you really think? I remember when I was a young student at school and even in those early years where I went to uni, I was a little bit like this. I was confronted and I felt a little bit uncomfortable sharing my views on different topics. A, because I guess those views weren't deeply honed and um, fully understood and uh, fire tested with experience and real life situations. But also, you know, I was growing, I was developing and I was uh, learning. So sometimes it's good just to be able to sit back, step back and um, appreciate what life has to, to offer and, to, um, and gain, to gain from the people around you. So the author here says that it's quite normal to be um, unsettled when confronted with the question, what do you really think? Because when we sit and look at the world that we have at the moment, you know, there are traps all around us where people are looking to cancel us based on our thoughts, based on our opinions. And if you don't share the opinion of uh, the left, then most certainly you know, you're going to be a, uh, a target, a target for attack and a target for uh, reprisal. But uh, I don't know about you, but I don't really give a damn um, what other people think because uh, as we said we're all entitled to our opinions and not all opinions have the same weight some people's opinions are featherweight other people's opinions are heavyweight so just because somebody says things just because a group of people have an opinion on something it doesn't mean that they have a monopoly on the truth or really know what they're talking about and I guess it comes with age when you uh, start to understand that not all opinion has the same weight and there is a lot of uh, BS opinion out there which is manipulated by the media it's politicized and uh, it's popularized I guess more than anything else um, nothing more than just it's just the flavor of the month and it doesn't it doesn't uh, see out the test of time um, over time I guess is the lesson that I've learned over the years so the bottom line is that the quality of our actions uh, depends on the quality of our thinking um, the ability to articulate the ability to uh, see the detail, the, the ability to understand the nuances and the first, second and third level consequences. Oh, I've just seen a sparrow 
I haven't seen a sparrow for years, especially here in the city. They've become as rare as hen's teeth. When I was young, there were sparrows everywhere. You'd see, hear them, you'd see them. But uh, over the past decade or two, they seem to have become uh, very, very rare indeed. So what we're saying here is that the quality of a person's life is based on the quality of their vocabulary, their ability to uh, contemplate, think, and to comp com com compartmentalize things is, uh, is critical. And not everybody has the building blocks to enable them to leverage thinking uh, because they don't have the vocabulary, they don't have the experience, they are not well read. The importance of reading and reading widely and reading deeply is to broaden your perspective by incorporating and considering OPE. OPE is basically other people's experiences. Uh, it's important to note that within our lifetime, whatever that lifetime is, for some it'll be three score and 10, for others they may get, get to 100, and for others, you know, getting to 30 is going to be a struggle. But what we're saying here is that each person's life is different and each person's lifetime has different slithers of reality, different amounts of experience that you come across. Um, because each person has a different past, each person will experience a different present. I am here, you are there, you're experiencing something different and we're all going to have a different future. And because of that, if we limit our worldview to our own slithers of experience, we could be bang on the money, but we, but we could be wildly um, mistaken. It's important to understand that um, just because things have happened in our life doesn't necessarily mean that those things and the meaning that we attach to them is the correct meaning or the empowering meaning. And that's why it's important, as I said, to broaden your experience where possible and to read and to talk to people of different generations to be able to get their perspectives and their slithers of experience so that you can either um, align their experience with your experiences to validate your, your views or to compare and contrast them to see if what you're thinking and what you've seen is uh, comparable and is uh, valid from a uh, perspective of um, you know, comparing it to other people's experience. So there are cultures that are thinking cultures. Um, for example, I, came, I come from a Greek culture and the Greek culture in many ways is a thinking culture. For those who have been to Greece, um, you know, you'll see that in ancient times with the uh, Greek philosophers, there's a, uh, there's a thinking, um, I guess, culture that permeates one's DNA. And it comes from the way you see the world, um, the Greek thought, the Greek way of thinking was one of Greece's greatest, greatest exports. And it's something that uh, differentiates the Greeks from many cultures. But, but it's also fair to say that the Greek thought and the Greek culture, and uh, the, which was the core and basis of Western civilization, has basically permeated and um, infused all of the cultures of the Western world but uh, the thinking cultures of Greece, now you go to Greece, every time I go to Greece, even though I'm, an, I'm a Greek Australian, I notice that there's a difference. They are more conversational. They are more opinionated. They are more heated and engaging in their, and, and emotional in their opinions. They love to chat. They love to mull things over. 
you know, you look at the news, the current affairs, uh, you, you look at politics, you look at the cafe culture, and uh, you know that Greece is a thinking culture or a culture that loves to discuss and to um, mull over things. Getting a bit loud down here, so my apologies. So um, the next point that the author makes here is that to generate good thinking amongst others, you need to give your undivided attention. This is an important lesson, an important message for parents, grandparents, educators, all of us need to understand this, that if you want to promote good thinking, you need to give the other person or persons undivided attention and room and time to think, to conceptualize and to express themselves. Um, you, need to, you need to leave you need to let other people, you need to allow other people an opportunity for them to state what they think without interruption. How important is that, just thinking about that, how important is it that we live in a world where we're constantly being interrupted? We're being talked over, we're being bombarded with marketing messages, um, we don't have very much peace at all. So uh, the point that the author here is making is a very, very powerful and valid point where they say that if you want to be, if you want to facilitate a thinking culture within your family, within your organization, you've got to have some rules. And the key rule is to allow people time to think and respond without constantly trying to fill in the space of uh, quiet with your noise or other people's noise. So a powerful, a powerful point and a, a simple but profound call to action. So um, the quality of your attention influences the quality of their thinking. So what we're saying here is zip it um, and to understand that they matter, their thoughts matter and the only way you're going to learn what other people are thinking is by stopping and allowing them to think and to express what they've got happening in their brains, in their minds. Going back and we're just going to reiterate a point that I made earlier that we need to remember that the mind holds, that the mind that holds the problem also holds the solution. And everything, but everything is figure outable. Uh, and that's a point that comes out of Marie Forleo's book, that everything is figure outable. If you give it your undivided attention, you give it time and you're not interrupted. You're not rudely interrupted, which uh, becomes harder and harder um, as we get older. So what we are saying here, what the author is saying, is people need to practice, uh, practice le listening presence. Uh, we need to craft incisive questions to lead to a solution. The Socratic, what's known as the Socratic method of inquiry. Socrates is said to be the father of Western philosophy. And uh, there have been many schools of philosophy that have come out of Greece. Uh, and Socrates is said to be the father of Western philosophy. And he was followed, of course, by Plato and Aristotle. But of course, there were other there were many, many other schools of philosophy in ancient Greece, many schools, and being Greek, I understand this, that there be many schools of thought, because whenever you get, you know, two or more Greeks together, you're always going to have <laughs> differing opinions and differing interests. So uh, it makes sense that Greece had multiple schools of philosophy, 
Socrates uh, was made famous for his so-called Socratic method of inquiry, where he would formulate very, very powerful and empowering questions um, and answer people's questions with questions. So what he did was he encouraged people to think and what we're saying here is over time this whole um, this whole technique this thinking culture has uh, evaporated and all, all but disappeared because these days um, people are just I guess manipulated into taking what other people think and treating it as gospel. Now you've got the Twitterati, Twitteraki, um, you've got social media, you've got all of these platforms now where you've got people known as influencers, people who probably wouldn't know if their bums were on fire, but are just heavily um, um, opinionated and have a large follow following. They become celebrities for no other reason that people just think that they're celebrities. But they've got no uh, no substance, no substance at all. So what what are we saying here? So the Socratic method of inquiry is to question things, is to come up with incisive, clever, empowering questions, because the type of question you ask will determine and lay foundation to the sort of response you're going to get. Going to get. If you ask dumb questions going to get dumb answers you know if you ask yourself disempowering questions you're going to get disempowering answers so that's why it's important and critical according to this author to be clever um, in the questions you ask and to remove assumptions that uh, that will enable to free up and unshackle our thinking so what are we saying here? The message to parents, the grandparents, the carers, to employers. Don't finish the sentences of the people that you're talking with. Give them time, give them the respect to enable them to finish their sentences. Because different people have a different pace when it comes to thinking and mulling over things. Some people are very quick, some people are, are relatively slow. Uh, you can tell how quickly a person's brain is operating. Um, I read this somewhere else, but I don't know once, once again if it's scientifically backed. But if a person talks quickly, obviously they're a quick thinker. If they talk slowly, then obviously they're a deep thinker. Now you can be a quick thinker, um, which infers, you know, fairly shallow thinker, or you can be a deep thinker and hence talk slower and take more time to contemplate and, and to consider things. So um, just observing the language and the quickness of a person's uh, c communication style will give you a, a lead in and an indicator in terms of what makes them tick. So don't finish people's sentences um, and allow them to think at their own pace. Let them formulate their thoughts uh, and let their words be wor their words. Don't go shoving your words into other people's mouths is one of the points that we're saying here. If you value thinking, if you value a thinking culture, then what you're going to do is you're going to allow people to formulate their thoughts and you're going to respectfully uh, listen to those thoughts and allow them to formulate them and present them as, as a thesis which is uninterrupted. So take turns to speak, don't interrupt. All are equal regardless of hierarchy. And by doing this, the author is suggesting that you increase the intelligence of a group we need to learn how to appreciate 
because when you appreciate people, it increases their thinking. We've got to minimize our criticism. The author uses a five to one ratio. You know, for every, for every negative comment or negative criticism that you make, you need to incorporate four positive criticisms to facilitate, to welcome, to uh, uh, fuel a thinking environment. So don't be too quick to criticize and to realize that um, um, and to release, sorry, not to realize, but to release the reins on people to enable them to gallop, to enable them to think, to formulate, and to, uh, and to um, express themselves as fully as they can. So thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Jim's 5am Club on the first day of winter here in Sydney town where the breeze is brisk, it's cold, but it does, it does make you feel alive. There's something about the cold wind on the face which refreshes and invigorates the soul. Anyway, take care everybody, yas us, and we'll chat again on this uh, beautiful Monday morning. Monday morning? No, it's Wednesday, sorry about that. Take care, bye.